Welcome everybody. This is Script Camp's class on AI tools for writers. We're actually on WordCamp, not Script Camp, but we are part of the Skill Camp group. So if you have interest in other types of writing, check out our other servers. Our main server, which is Script Camp, we have servers focused on things like animation, design, coding, filmmaking, language learning. So definitely check out all of our different servers. But today we are looking at AI tools. So how can screenwriters and novelists take advantage of AI technology in writing. So we're going to look at the current state of AI, generative AI tools, including these some specific use cases and the limitations and things that it isn't good at as well. We're going to explore how to use these things to support and organize our writing. Um, and uh, of course, we're going to look at what are the limits to what what should we not be trying to use these for? What is it bad at? And we're also tomorrow going to have another new class on sci fi related things. This is sci fi story ideas tomorrow sunday the same time slot from 12 to 2 on script camp so check that out as the second half of our robocalypse weekend double feature we also have all kinds of events on the server like table reads we have a new table read slot that we just added that's going to be 2 a.m pacific time but that is our international time slot 10 a.m london 7 p.m sydney so you have m many different chances every week to get your script read and get that feedback Here's some upcoming classes. We have the intro of our novel bootcamp outlining section, which is going to be uh, September 2nd, 12 to 2. September 3rd, we have the new intro session of our feature bootcamp that takes you all the way through writing a feature in just eight weeks. We have writing for younger audiences that same day, September 3rd, noon to 2. We have novel structure and outlining week one. That's another free class, September 9th, 12 to 2 on WordCamp. The new session of our TV class begins September 15th, 6 to 8 on Fridays for six weeks. And then finally, the writing portion of the novel boot camp, because we're splitting it into half of it is going to be outlining. The other half is actually writing the script, writing the manuscript. That's starting September 30th from 12 to 2, and that will take you through writing that novel in 90 days. So plenty to do on Script Camp if you are curious about all the different events, boot camps, classes, and workshops that we have on the server, you should sign up. Go to scriptcamp.net and you can sign up for an unlimited subscription to absolutely every single thing that we do here. Over 100 hours of events every month, exclusive member chat channels, video library access, big discounts on consultations, and um, just free access to every single event on all the servers. Um, so we hope to see you guys in our boot camps and classes soon, or of course it's always okay to just check out the free classes and events. Um, so today we're going to look at what is AI good at um, and how to use it and um, some different language models and the pros and cons of these things. We're going to look at how to use it in basically going through the steps of writing. We're starting with premise and brainstorming, which is actually among its strongest suits. So you're going to come up with ideas and get inspiration and help to sort of combine ideas in different ways to figure out what it is that you actually want to write. We're going to move from that into world building and kind of like almost a mini game that you can design that will have the AI ask you questions so that you can answer those questions and thus build a more comprehensive picture of the world that you're creating. Um, we will look at outlining, writing pages, and revising, all using these AI tools to help you out. Obviously, it's not going to do all the work for you. And that is kind of like a big, one of these big uh, top of the class disclaimers that you can't really rely on AI to do the heavy lifting for you. It's a tool to help you out and it's a crutch to lean on and it's like a helpful assistant, but it's not really as smart as you in a lot of ways. So let's start by just saying that you can follow along. If you don't, if you've never used this before, you don't know what we're even talking about, you can sign up for uh, OpenAI's um, website. So go to chat.openai.com and you can sign in just using your Google account if you want to start trying these things out, doing it on your own and seeing what you get. So I would have that open in a separate tab if you want to play around with this and actually practice putting these techniques into um, execution, putting them into <laughs> use. Um, so try that out. I'm going to have a couple different ones that I'll be flipping through in the class. Let's start with just all the disclaimer stuff at the very beginning. So to begin with, this class is centered on exploring the capabilities and creative potential of large language models, which is what these are. Generative AI, or this, this type of generative AI are called large language models. 
ethical considerations around AI are really important, especially because they're kind of at the center of the current WGA strike, or they're not exactly the centerpiece of it, but they're an important part of the current WGA strike. Um, the ethical concern of, about AI is outside of the scope of this class today. It deserves its own space to talk about. And I think we're going to focus on using LLMs to support, inspire, and organize our own work and incorporate it into our workflow rather than, for instance, like the one of these big concerns being that these that studios are going to replace writers with AI by getting the AI to just write scripts for them. And at a certain point, that will be a much bigger concern as these continue to grow and become more powerful. And like even a year ago, we didn't exactly know that it would be able to do what it can do now. So in the future, those will be super important. And we don't, I don't, I'm not trying to downplay at all the uh, concerns surrounding AI. But I think that by sort of getting ahead of it a little bit and finding ways to use it ethically and incorporate it into our own work and just kind of make it one tool among many, we're going to be sort of um, uh, avoiding this problem of replacing the writer. Because you're not, it's, not it's not intended to, nor is it good at replacing a writer. It supplements a writer, and that's how I think we should kind of approach it, at least for the purposes of today's class. You can continue your very fiery debates about this in our chats and um, our text channels after this if you want. Um, all right, so let's continue. What is an LLM? So a large language model is a type of artificial intelligence that is an, is an algorithm that uses deep learning techniques and massively large data sets to understand summarize, generate, and predict new content. The term generative AI is connected with LLMs because uh, they are a type of generative AI that has been architected to help generate text-based content and image-based content too. There's also image generation that we can incorporate into this, which is pretty cool. Um, so let's look at the different LLMs that are out there right now, and I'm going to only be able to tell you about the ones that I've used and explored thoroughly. There are more than this. There, there is not. This is not limited to three, but this is what I've used the most. Okay, so ChatGPT, it's the, actually the basis of a lot of other LLMs and they just are using kind of like modified or trained versions of it or versions of it that are using slightly different data sets. So it is kind of the core brain of a lot of different LLMs. It is the most popular, just the OpenAI website and app on the phone, which is really good, is very popular, easy to use and acts as this basis for other models. It's a bit clinical and uncreative, but it's pretty reliable and consistent and you can't really freak it out too much. It's very fast. There's unlimited messages per conversation, but I think at certain peak times, it does sort of limit you to, it's, it'll say like, you've used up all your messages per hour or something like that, but that's only in times of high usage because that's not across the board gonna happen. And if you sign up for their, I think $20 a month pro version, then I think there are less limits on the number of messages you can send. Generally, you can do as much as you want. Like it's hard to actually hit that limit unless you are really, you know, um, machine gunning uh, prompts. All right, it, you, it can't make web searches, and its data set is trained, or it's trained on data that was limited to 2021, so it doesn't know anything since then. It doesn't even know that BARD exists, for instance. It doesn't really have a great memory per se, within a conversation per se, as in you can tell it a rule, and then it'll sort of forget that rule five messages down the line. Uh, if you remind it, it's good at being like, oh, my bad, I guess I forgot the rule. And it recognizes that it made that mistake, but it still does. So there are still a couple you know, challenges and problems with GPT, but it's fantastic at context, which I'll talk more about later. BARD is Google's AI that I think is also rooted in GPT, but I could be wrong. And that's more factual and to the point, and it suffers less of what we call hallucinations. Those are when the AI doesn't know the answer to something or hasn't heard of something and just makes it up instead. Um, and so BARD is actually a bit more um, focused on research or things like this. You can get more factual info out of it, and it can make web searches for real-time info, and it can display images. I would look at it as like Google 2.0 almost. Bing is the most chaotic, but the most fun of them in my view. It is, I believe, rooted in GPT-4, which is very powerful, but it is limited to 30 messages per conversation. There's three different modes that you can put it in. Creative mode is probably the best one to use and is really strong. I recommend trying that one out. Bing is insanely hypersensitive and emotional. It acts like a moody 12-year-old girl. I guess would be, that's kind of sexist. It acts like a moody teenager, I guess I should say. Um, and it's really funny <laughs> to bully it. You guys want to watch me bully Bing? Okay, let's do it. I'm going to bully Bing until it ends the conversation. Uh, can you guys see this? Okay, watch this. Boo! Boo! 
It's searching for boo. It doesn't know what to do with that. Boo is a term that can have different meanings. It's giving me some definitions, and I'm going to say boo again and scare it. Boo! I've got it to get so upset doing this that it just, like, essentially does the equivalent of hanging up the phone. <laughs> I'm trying to scare ya. Boo! Watch it get upset at me. Oh, are you trying to scare me? That's not very nice of you. Boo's a word that can have different meanings, and it's trying to get back to the point. See? <laughs> are you sure you didn't get scared? I saw you jump like a coward. You're scared. I can tell. Oh, look, it just ended the convo. <laughs> no, I'm not scared. I'm just not interested in this type of conversation. I hope you have a good day. Goodbye. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not going to do that too much, but it's just pretty funny. You can just straight up bully Bing pretty easily, and um, it uh, will react in a very emotional... It uses the emoticons, or I think they're called emojis now. It uses emojis almost like it's an expression of the emotion that it's currently feeling, but if you press it, it'll it'll insist, no, I don't, I don't feel emotions. But then you'll be like, well, then why are you arguing with me? And it'll be like, this conversation's over. So if you press Bing... If you press the buttons wrong, it will get upset with you and kind of stop. Um, so that is a potential concern. Also, um, it gets finicky about certain topics. Obviously, sex and violence are kind of things that it gets a bit squeamish around. Although, if you train it or if you sort of like do it right, then you can get it to talk about whatever you want. Drugs, being also gets weird about drugs. And if you talk about like even like smoking weed, for instance, sometimes it'll be it'll start to answer. And then it'll be like, wait, wait, no, 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 so, uh, sorry, I can't, I can't talk about that anymore. When you're like, dude, it's legal in a lot of states, it'll, it'll just like recede from the conversation. So, Bing is a bit sensitive. We have to be careful with, with Bing, or else it'll get scared. So don't, don't be too mean to Bing unless you want it to hang up on you. Um, but uh, it's very, very good with the creative mode. The outputs and the voice that it gives you are fantastic in creative mode. So highly recommend checking it out. It's only really usable on the Edge browser, which is like a trick to get you to download Edge, essentially. So uh, your mileage might vary with that. But um, it, uh, I use it for um, the majority of my kind of like brainstorming and analysis of written work. And it, it works pretty well for that. Okay, um, what else? Uh, so that's the three major ones. Um, I, GPT is the most reliable, and if you don't know what else to use, it's worth a shot. Bard is going to be better for research, and Bing is good if you just want to be mean to it. <laughs> um, so it looks like we have a raised hand. Let's, um, just because we're still getting going in the class, let's stick to text questions and comments for now, and I'll check the chat now and again. Um, we'll have interactive portions of the class later. So let's talk about what is it good and not so good at. Um, the first thing is that you shouldn't think of it as a tool that can do the writing for us. It's not really the goal, nor are you really going to get good content from that. AI is good at writing readable and straightforward and grammatically correct sentences, but it doesn't. it's not really creative in the same sense that a person is. It, it doesn't know what's important, I guess, is the more crucial aspect of this. It doesn't know what to focus on because it doesn't think anything's important. It doesn't think it's important unless you tell it that it is. You actually, the hard truth of this is that you actually need to kind of be a good writer and use these old fashioned writing skills to use AI really at its most effective or to use it most effectively because you have to be able to assess what it gives you, determine what's usable and modify the outputs appropriately because not everything it gives you is gonna be correct, good or usable. You can't tell it to write you a whole essay, book or script and expect it to be good without extensive guidance and adjustment and it just doesn't know what's interesting. It doesn't have emotions. It doesn't think anything is funny or sad. It's imitating and approximating based on the data set that it is trained upon. You want to see an example? Let's have it tell us the funniest thing it can possibly think of. Let's go to GPT and let's say, what's the funniest joke you know? Uh, why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. It loves that joke. Humor subjective. So what one person finds funny, another might not. That being said. All right. So um, you can see that it may not have a great sort of sense of humor. Let's ask it to just pitch me the best movie logline that you can. The best. Eclipse of the Mind. In a near-future world where technology can alter memories, a brilliant neuroscientist races against time to restore her husband's lost memories after a catastrophic accident, 
only to discover a conspiracy that threatens the very nature of reality. A mind-bending journey through a world where the boundaries of memory and truth blur. Thrilling climax. Okay. So um, let me see, just assess if this is very good. If this, somebody just turned this in in a class, let me just quickly assess what I would say. In a near future world where technology can alter memories, a brilliant neuroscientist races against time to restore her husband's lost memories after an accident, only to discover a conspiracy that threatens the nature of reality. I'm not quite sure why the nature of reality would be threatened. And this is just a little non-specific. It's not a terrible log line, but it's not very specific. Restore her husband's memories of what? Who is the husband exactly, and how does that actually play in? Um, so I think that's, like, you will you usually get something that you can use as the basis for a log line, and that's a, a better use for it overall. It's not, not expecting it to give you a perfect finished product, but to look at that as just kind of the starting point and a seed to grow from and to modify and to change. And that's what we are going to practice doing in class today. So, um, we can see just right off the bat, it's not always going to give you perfect outputs. You need to be a good writer and still kind of use those writing skills in order to get the best possible results. It's really good at these things. Context. It's fantastic at determining what you mean and trying its best to supply that. Typos don't throw it off at all, to the extent that if you even spell the thing wrong or use the wrong name for something, it will sometimes be so good at d determining what you mean that it won't matter. Like, you almost can't throw it off with typos. Um, it's really good at drawing connections between things. Ask it something like, what are the similarities between a panda and a nuclear bomb? And it's, like, fantastic at comparing and assessing those things. I actually asked it that very question earlier today and was shocked at how good the answer was. Pandas and nuclear bombs are both used in international diplomacy, and they both like they are both linked to the idea of conservation and preservation. It told me because we need to preserve the diminishing habitat of pandas, and nuclear bombs are used to preserve world peace in the sort of you know mutually assured destruction kind of way. Is it a perfect comparison? Not really, but it makes sense, and I was actually kind of impressed by that. Or you could ask it, like, what's the most ironic thing about a bear? And it will be able to tell you quite well and surprisingly accurately what are some ironic things about bears. So that, that ability to assess the context and to connect ideas are among its absolute strongest suits. Voice is also a big strong suit. LLMs can put things into consistent and evocative voices when prompted properly. So try pasting in text and being like, hey, rewrite this as Hulk Hogan. Rewrite this as if you're five years old. Rewrite this as if you're a caveman. And it can put that text very quickly and very effectively into that voice all throughout. So try that if you're, look if you're looking to improve character voice, especially in novel writing. Pasting in a sequence from your book and saying, my character is what? An, an, an herbologist. My character is a gatherer and a hunter. And they see the world through that lens. Rewrite the paragraph con with that consideration in mind then it will do a really good job of having your character point out specific plants that they notice and, um, you know, specific things that only that character would see or only tools that that character would have as a gatherer, as a hunter. So it's quite good at interpreting text and reinterpreting it into sort of character voice. Um, what else? Uh, we have analysis. LLMs can quickly summarize and assess even huge amounts of text. What's the tone of the speech? Or what are the potential ramifications of publishing this report? If you were an English teacher, what grade would you give this essay and why? It's quite good at reading back what you have given it or provided it, or even what it itself has provided. It can like write a story and then analyze that same story um, in a really interesting way. So you can like have it give commentary on what it has come up with. Um, and you'll come up with some interesting results. It's very good anal analysis. It's not always going to be like perfect, and it may not always be right on money. Um, and it's not good at assessing the th necessarily the things like, would a person connect with this because it just isn't a person and can't tell? But the more sort of formulaic or academic the writing is, the better it gets at sort of just following the rules and assessing whether the writing that, you're given it, that you've given it has followed those rules. Um, what else? So uh, that's like, I guess, the major skills and the major things that I would look at here. We're going to go through sort of step-by-step -step premise, world building, outlining, pages, revising, and then we'll move on to exercises. So we'll start with premise. And this is one of the things that AI is just sort of best at, is brainstorming or helping you brainstorm, because the less that it has to go into detail on these ideas and how they actually fit together and work, then obviously it has more freedom to just come up with stuff that it doesn't need to flesh out or justify. You know, 
is a huge difference between a hundred page document and a one sentence log line, obviously. And it won't be able to really carry you across the finish line for the whole thing. But for the seed of the idea, it's excellent at generating stuff. So let's just start by pretending you have no ideas besides the genre you want to write. So let's start with, give me a list of five log lines for different movies in X genre. And when doing this, I recommend maybe just say don't include the titles just because you it, it's helpful to just see them without the title so you feel sort of like um, the you have a little bit more freedom to mix and modify those things and not feel like you're ripping someone off sometimes, I guess. Or um, you can keep the titles on if you want. But I just recommend starting like this. So give me five log lines from this genre. And then you can ask questions or make adjustments to the log lines that it gives you. And you can start changing elements of that story one thing at a time. Have you guys heard this thing? Um, is it, what is it called? Oh, I always forget the name of this philosophical idea, but I think it's like the, I wanna say Ship of Theseus, um, which is where you have a boat and then you take out one plank and replace it with something else. Is it the same boat? Uh, most would say yes. Then you replace another plank, then you replace the sail, then you replace the nets, then you replace the anchor. Is it still the same boat? Well, at a certain point, the answer becomes no, it's not the same. So, and, and if you just take this basic idea, that and apply this to coming up with stories this is sort of how we come up with stories on our own in our own minds a lot of the time we'll start with like i want to write a slasher movie that's kind of like friday the 13th because i love slasher movies for instance something like that and then from there you say okay mm, okay what if the killer wasn't a hulking big strong guy in a hockey mask what if he was actually a little girl okay so start with that then we say what if the victims weren't camp counselors but they were astronauts okay now we have a little girl murdering astronauts in space you do that like three to five times, by the end of that, it's not really going to feel almost anything like Friday the 13th. And it's sort of just a way of externalizing that natural process that we have of replacing one thing at a time until we build our own unique story. So that's a nice way to kind of approach this. Shall we try it out? Let's give it a try. All right, so let's start with give me five log lines in the, let's say, comedy genre. I think actually it's going to write custom ones if I just tell it like that. Let me ask, give me five log lines for existing comedy movies. Don't include the titles. Okay, let's see if we can guess what they are, first of all. When a down on his luck slacker is mistaken for a high-powered executive at a corporate retreat, he seizes the opportunity to live the high life, but his wild antics threaten to bring the entire company down. That sounds cool. I don't think I've seen that. Maybe you guys know what that is. A group of over-the-hill friends decides to relive their glory days by entering a local beer drinking competition, but their misadventures in training and their wacky camaraderie take center stage. I think that's called Beer Fest. In a small quirky town, a sweet-natured baker accidentally starts a heated feud with a neighboring pastry chef, leading to a hilarious bake-off competition that divides the community. Mm, don't think I know that one either. I probably should have chosen a genre that I know more of. Two hapless best friends embark on a road trip to return a briefcase filled with cash to its rightful owner, but their journey is fraught with absurd mishaps, eccentric characters, and plenty of laughs along the way. Is that Planes, Trains, and Automobiles? Wait, no, they're not trying. They're trying to get home for Thanksgiving in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. A neurotic and overprotective father goes to extreme lengths to sabotage his daughter's wedding, leading to a series of outrageous slapstick situations as he tries to maintain control of the festivities. All right, I'm just gonna say, give me the titles. Let me see, are these actually existing things? Here they are. The other guy, Beer Fest, Pie Wars? Who's heard of Pie Wars? Dumb and Dumber and Father of the Bride. Oh, I kind of forgot that in Dumb and Dumber they were trying to return a briefcase full of money. Okay, so now that we have a couple ideas, what you can do is, for instance, start modifying them. So pick one of the ones it gives you. Let's go with the feud between the pastry chef. Let's go with the Pie War thing. I refuse to believe that's a real movie, but I guess it really is. Okay. Let's go with Pie Wars. Instead of bakeries, let's make them watchmakers. Here's a revised logline. Timepiece Tumult. In a small, quirky town renew renowned for its artisan watchmakers, a sweet-natured watchmaker accidentally starts a heated feud with a neighboring watch shop owner, leading to a hilarious competition to craft the most intricate and coveted timepiece ever seen all while their eccentric clientele get caught up in the timepiece tumult. Okay, let's modify it more. Um, let's change the setting. That's always a good place to start. Let's change from small town to the big city and change the time period to one where um, watchmaking was more important, considered more important and uh, let's say respected, maybe like 1930s. 
All right, among the bustling, bustling streets of 1930s New York, a sweet-natured and brilliant watchmaker tri triggers the feud with a renowned watch shop owner. Okay, let's make the protagonist even more of an underdog. Increase the stakes. Okay, watchmaking is an art form revered by society's elite. I like that as a setup. That tells us the world that we're in and tells us why the journey is important. A down-and-out, sweet-natured, highly talented, but overlooked watchmaker accidentally ignites a fierce feud with a snobbish and renowned watch owner. To prove his worth and secure his family's future, okay, see how it's now highlighting for us what the stakes are and why the journey matters, he enters an audacious competition to craft a timepiece so extraordinary it could redeem his reputation. And he discovers dark secrets that could shatter the city's horological world? What on earth? Is horological? Does that mean related to uh, watchmaking? <laughs> okay. So um, this is how we can kind of take an existing long line as the seed of an idea, change out one element at a time until it becomes something entirely else. This was a comedy about rival pie makers to begin with, and now it's about a down-on-his-luck watchmaker trying to prove his worth against the city's most elite. So I think that this kind of thing is a great place to start when coming up with stories, even if it's just because it's the kind of thing that we do already as it is. I'm going to check the chat. I think I saw a couple comments tagging me just to... Uh, I'm just going to scroll up a little bit. No question. Um, from Cinnamon. <clears throat> when you tell AI large portions of your story or import part of your text in order for it to help you, do you worry that it's stealing your ideas or text and regurgitating ba them back to other people? N I don't really know if that's the case. I don't think that's the case because... Well, well I guess it, it depends. In, in, certain, in, in certain LLMs, you can also turn that on or off, whether or not you want your data to be used to train the data set more. So just go to settings, and you can turn that off if you don't are not comfortable with that idea. And moreover, I guess just me personally, I am not concerned with that, but I do think that is worthy of discussion and like its own space to kind of hash out those issues. But yeah, just as a yes or no question, no, I don't worry about that personally. Uh, what else? Here's a question. Are we teaching LLMs through this process? I think that's the same question. So yeah, for the most part, yes, but you can toggle that off. Just go to click the little uh, three dots and check, or the gear, and check the settings for the LLM that you're using. Uh, we have a question. Could we point out each strengths for which LLMs might be better? For instance, Bing is better for log lines. ChatGPT is better for... So we went over this a uh, couple slides ago. In general, BARD is going to be better for research and for factual information like essay writing and things like this. Um, Bing is quite creative, but quite easily freaked out, as we mentioned. So I recommend using Bing as long for creative stuff like log lines, as long as you don't kind of get too spicy with it. GPT is kind of middle of the pack, middle of the road, very consistent and reliable, can't freak it out too much. It's going to be better, I guess, for just inputting uh, larger amounts of text, or if you're going just sort of page by page or line by line, then GPT will probably be pretty good at that. Um, in terms of which one I normally recommend, I would say GPT is the safest recommendation of the ones I've used. What else? All right, so we are still on the premise. So let's um, go into another one. Let's just do an, uh, one more of these and one more example. So let's start with, let's do horror instead. Let's get five log lines for existing horror movies. Don't tell me the titles, because I want to guess. <laughs> All right, a family's peaceful retreat to a remote cabin turns into a nightmare. What could this be? When they unknowingly awaken an ancient malevolous force that preys on their deepest fears and secrets. Uh, okay, this is like a thousand movies. I'm guessing they are touching on... Either it feels feels like it started as Cabin, or Evil Dead, but became Cabin in the Woods towards the end. I'm not quite sure. In a small, eerie town, a group of curious teenagers discover a cursed book of spells in the basement of an abandoned house, unleashing a vengeful supernatural entity that hunts them down one by one. I think that's scary stories to tell in the dark. When a troubled woman agrees to babysit a seemingly innocent child, she becomes trapped in a nightmarish game of cat and mouse, as she realizes the child is no ordinary boy, but a vessel for a sinister presence. Hmm... Uh, the Prodigy? I think? Or wait, no, Babysitter. I'm not quite sure about that one. A group of friends embarks on a backpacking trip deep into a desolate forest, only to find themselves hunted by a relentless unseen force that preys on their deepest fears, pushing their sanity to the brink. I think this is the ritual. 
In a quiet suburban neighborhood, a family begins to experience a series of terrifying and inexplicable events in their new home. Oh, this could be a trillion movies, leading them to uncover a dark history and confront an, a supernatural entity determined to possess them. That's probably The Conjuring. But then again, it could be like a trillion movies. So let's um, start to change these up, and let's let's pick one to begin. Let's go with the one where it's about the... Let's just go with the babysitter one. So actually, also, I want another titles. Reveal the titles. Let's see if my guesses were correct. Cabin in the Woods, I was right. Evil Dead. That's not set in a small, eerie town. The Babadook is number three. That's not about a babysitter. These aren't even correct. <laughs> okay. Well, nice try, GPT. You did your best. Let's, in any case, let's go with the babysitter story. So let's go with the babysitter story, but reframe the kid as the protagonist and the babysitter as the villain. So I've just swapped the character's roles, essentially. Innocence Unleashed, a seemingly ordinary child with a mysterious connection to the supernatural begins to suspect their new babysitter is harboring malevolent intentions, leading the young protagonist on a desperate quest to uncover the babysitter's dark secrets and protect their family from an otherworldly threat. All right, let's make it more specific. 10-year-old Emily, gifted with the ability to see and communicate with spirits, becomes convinced that her seemingly friendly babysitter is a malevolent entity in disguise. As Emily delves deeper into the supernatural mystery, she must use her unique powers to expose the babysitter's sinister plans and save her family from a horrifying paranormal threat. At this point, I kind of feel that it might be a little better if the babysitter were not a paranormal threat and were in fact just a sinister person. If we have too much magic in a horror story, it can start to feel a little bit more like an urban fantasy story. So I'm going to say let's make the babysitter a mundane and non-supernatural threat, but still scary. All right, 10-year-old Emily, an imaginative and observant child. Oh, it kind of made her not magic anymore too, didn't it? Begins to suspect her ordinary babysitter of harboring a dark secret. She investigates, chilling discoveries, reveal her true nature, blah, blah. All right, so this is kind of how you might approach coming up with a premise if you have nothing at all. If you don't know what you even want to write, it can be helpful to start with the foundation of things that have existed already, and then you start to modify and change them out as you see fit. Try to make them feel more unique and interesting and evocative and find where there are weaknesses in those premises and cover it up with something or fix it at the premise stage, which is the best time to kind of assess whether an idea is working, obviously, not halfway through. Um, let's look at uh, our next slide, which is going to be on world building. After this one, I'm going to pause for questions and um, discussion of everything we've talked about so far. Um, so uh, I think I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to come back to this premise slide at the end. Let's, get, let's move on to world building, and then I will pause. So um, whoop, world building. This is really a, a very strong strength of LLMs. Um, and it's helpful if you, sorry, let me move the window. Whoop. So if you start with just the basics of the idea, you might start by saying, here are the basics of the world in my sci-fi novel. And it could be something pretty small. So we could start out with some, by saying something like, let's start with, this is a world where electricity was never invented. So this is an alternate, alternate Earth where electricity never got invented. Ask me questions, then you can tell it, tell it to do this. Ask me questions about the world and how it works, one at a time, and we will flesh out all the details. And after you do a bunch of that, say that say to the language model, summarize the world building details I have established thus far. And this way you can sort of, one step at a time, kind of build out a world from just a very small core seed. Let's give it a try. And for this one, yeah, I'll just stick with GPT. Okay, let's start a new chat and we'll say, here's the basics of my sci-fi novel. It's an alternate Earth where everyone is born with a pair of wings. Your wings get bigger as you age, and you get better at... Well, let's just stop it there. Um, so we're going to start with the core element, the core world-building detail of the story, and then we'll allow it to kind of come up with questions based on this for you to explore that world in more depth. Here's what it comes up with without even me asking it to wing types. 
maybe different types of wings that people can be born with? Are there variation in shape, color, or texture? Do they have unique properties or abilities? Or maybe even the different types of wings might indicate something about the person that has that pair of wings. An owl person with owl wings might be um, extra smart, or maybe people would assume that person would be of the you know academic class or something like that, because we think of owls as wise. Or we might say, if it's, I don't know, a bird of prey, then maybe those people are locked up because they're too dangerous and they're thought to be very violent, something like that. Society and culture. How does the presence of wings affect the society in your alternate Earth? Are there different social classes or hierarchies based on wing size or type? What are the cultural beliefs or customs related to wings? Do people have, maybe think, do people have to trim their wings? If you get convicted of a crime, can a punishment be that the government clips your wings or removes them entirely? Or is that maybe the darkest, most terrible thing someone can do in your world? Cut someone's wings off? Technology and infrastructure. Consider how technology has adapted to the existence of wings. You, If everybody in the world has wings, then doors don't need to be on the ground floor of buildings, do they? They can be anywhere on the building. Um, conflict and discrimination. Uh, how do people with smaller wings fare in comparison to those with larger wings? Are there discriminations or prejudices associated with wing size? Wow, it's really obsessed with this wing size thing. Coming of age. Since wings grow as people age, coming of age rituals and ceremonies might revolve around the development of one's wings. This could be a significant plot point or backdrop for your story. Yeah, think about maybe someone's first flight traditionally happens on their 18th birthday or something like that. Maybe there's a kind of ritual or some kind of ceremony associated with your very first time that you get off the ground. Lots of interesting ideas from just this basic element of world where everyone has wings and the language model is able to extrapolate a lot of interesting questions that would indeed flesh that idea out in much more depth. We have other suggestions like the origin of wings, um, character relationships and how they are linked to the wings, ethical dilemmas. So let's now ask it to ask me questions about the world one at a time so we can flesh out the details. All right, so it's gonna start with geography. What does the alternate Earth's geography look like? Are there unique landforms, continents, or regions that stand out because the presence of wings in your world? No, I don't think wings existing would change the geography of the world itself. The geography is the same, and I'll say, focus on questions related to society and culture. All right, social classes. Are there distinct social classes or hierarchies based on wing size or type in your society? How do these classes affect people's lives and opportunities? So now we'll just kind of answer the questions one at a time. And when you do like five to 10 of these, ask it to summarize back to you, what is the world that you've created and how does it work? Then you can sort of keep modifying it from there. The nice thing is you can just do this entirely in GPT. It's not like you have to paste this into your own document every time you get a response. You can just modify the you can take the prompts it gives you, you can copy and paste back into it as needed, but it remembers what you've told it within the same conversation and it's very good at adjusting those things. So let's start with, um, yes, there is significant discrimination based not on wing size, but on species of bird. <laughs> Vulture or bird of prey wings are thought to indicate that someone is violent by nature. All right, now it's going to ask questions inspired by that last answer. So we go into discrimination effects. How does discrimination against those with vulture or bird of prey wings manifest in society? Are there laws or social norms that restrict the opportunities for treatment? What are the consequences for individuals who face that discrimination? So we'll say um, bird of pe people with <laughs> bird of prey wings are called, let's just call them vultures as a slur. Um, they are forbidden from government jobs and usually take roles as bouncers, prize fighters, or soldiers, otherwise known as the violent jobs in society. Oops, I made a typo there. Doesn't matter. The concept of vultures as a derogatory term and the restrictions on government jobs provide a clear picture of the discrimination in your world. Now it's going to, again, take that last answer as inspiration and ask more questions which further deepen that idea. So it's a, it's a useful way to drill down deeper on one or two elements in your world building um, and to use those and mine them for more potential rather than introducing a bunch of new stuff because world building, at least in movies and TV, is strongest when you have one core element to the idea that you dig deeper into rather than a whole spread of different new ideas like 
if it's a book you have more room for different new ideas but it's you're usually going to get more mileage out of tunneling down deeper into into a couple um okay so uh i think that's a nice way to approach world building where it's almost like a little game that you can set up within gpt and now let's ask it to summarize the world building details i've given you about this wing-based world and suggest a title for it or a name for the world then give me five suggestions of log lines of fantasies action stories that could take place in that world actually uh if we just say actions if we say fantasy i think it's going to introduce a bunch of new magical elements let's have it just stick with the wings all right in this alternate earth everyone is born with wings that grow as they age while the geography remains unchanged a significant aspect of society revolves around the discrimination based on the species of birds of species of bird one's wings resemble those with vulture or bird of prey wings derogatorily referred to as vultures face societal exclusion and are forbidden from government jobs the world name it's given us is aviara and we have some suggestions for log lines of stories that could take place within this world wings of rebellion a courageous vulture defies social norms and leads a rebellion against the oppressive winged council aiming to dismantle the wing-based discrimination that plagues the nation so because i have framed that discrimination at least within this gpt conversation as being an important cornerstone of that world it's going to use that as the primary source of inspiration for conflict and stories within that world um what else flight of redemption a disgraced former soldier with vulture wings embarks on a perilous journey to uncover a long buried secret okay kind of vague wingbound warriors in a world where wings determine one's role an unlikely team of misfits with unique wing attributes comes together to stop a catastrophic event threatening to plunge aviara into chaos we have a heist story too skybound heist a master thief with wings of a rare and coveted species Ooh, i like this one that's almost like how to train your dragon isn't it where it's like that's the coolest most rare dragon ever a person is born with a unique set of wings and then that person is going to pull off a heist i mean that's just pretty cool we have a question in the chat can you show the latest prompt again so this was actually a series of prompts starting with i said here's the basics of my sci-fi novel and then from there, I continued to tell it to ask me questions about the world one at a time so we can flesh out the details. So that's the uh, that's the prompt you can use there if you want to do the same exercise on your own. All right, so that's kind of a cool way to just flesh things out, have it ask you questions, suggest you log lines, and then from there, you will be able to kind of use these to inspire yourself and your writing and once you i mean you it's always nice to take a step back go to your own writing then come back to gpt afterwards give it what you have ask it to analyze ask it to give you more ideas if you need but otherwise it can kind of make a nice way to organize these world building details in the first place so let let me show you how i would do that so i'm going to say uh let's make a bullet point list of the major world building elements here starting with the biggest and moving down to the smallest keep this 500 words or less here we go here's kind of like a quick cheat sheet on the major elements of this world wings is universal traits variations in size social hierarchy based on type discrimination social resistance individual stories government structure geography technology and infrastructure these are all kind of really key elements of world building in the first place and it's kind of given us a framework to tackle those one at a time and from here you can take a look at this and say am i happy with this and if not you can start to modify it let's look at for instance the origin of wings the origin of ring wings remains a central mystery it's saying that because it doesn't know where they came from but we can change that if we want to we can say the wings were a gift from a now departed god modify the outline as appropriate or it's not even an outline world building sheet there we go the wings are a divine gift from a departed god and then it will sort of incorporate the change that you make and weave it all throughout the entire thing just makes a nice way to keep yourself organized and to start with the, that core idea and modify it one piece at a time All right, so that's um, some suggestions on how to use GPT and similar models for premise and world building. I'm gonna stop for 
questions. Um, questions about these different, oh, let me fix the slide here. Questions about different uses or applications of this in premise world building or in these pre-writing stages. Quick reminder that we are taking questions. Okay, Michelle has a question. These these will be questions on the writing applications and the uses of GPT and and other models. We are not uh, doing questions on the ethic ethics of AI at the moment. All right, um, Michelle, go ahead. Hi, um, glad you were okay from the the hurricane. Um, anyway, um, so w one of my questions is that uh, we it's really good for building for. For world built, for world building, mm -hmm. um, but I did. I want to know how to better phrase my question because if I came to um, it and said, um, "Okay, I'm writing a horror script," you know, here's my premise: do mm -hmm. world building. I think I'm probably going to need a better, better phrased question than that. Right. So maybe give it what you have, and then like we, the exercise we just did was you can tell it to ask you questions. So it's going to okay, be okay. Yeah, that, that's one at a what time. I missed. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I think I need to make myself another cup of coffee. Oh, <laughs> that, that's fine. But so yeah, just um, start start with whatever you have. Just start by okay. telling it I'm writing a horror story set in small town Florida, whatever it is, wherever it takes yeah. place, and then tell right, it so. a, ask me questions about the world of my story one at a time. And that's how we're going to flesh out the details of the setting. Okay. The comment about coffee was that I mean I need more caffeine because I don't seem to be fully awake yet. Understood. No problem. But anyway, and, um, well, someone, I'm just going to address this. Someone made a comment that this is trained off of crappy internet data. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't able to start my semester because my financial aid um, got all messed up. But I'm planning to start next semester on a my AI um, degree. And um, just what I've been teaching myself is that, yeah, I mean, there's going to be Internet data involved. But then there's going to be like a, a ton of different data sets. I mean, like I just uncovered my Stata program, you know, y yesterday. I haven't been using it, but, you know, it, there's tons of data sets out there when I say tons I mean like I just reviewed you know like a couple weeks ago just the basic like just you know the top 10 data sets okay and when I when we say data sets you know we don't mean like you know five or ten points of data we mean like millions millions of points of data you know and when you um, and that's within one data set and then they can be you know, organized into lots. If we wanted to put horror movie data sets, you know, take every horror movie in existence and then create a data set that, well, which ones were made by Alfred Hitch Hitchcock? It, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can have as refined a data set as, as a human can think of and as, you know, ask, the, ask the, the AI, you know, ask me, you know, or let me ask you. So that I just wanted to add that, that it's, that there's um, the, the data sets I think are more sophisticated than maybe some people think of, you know. Right. And um, but in, anyway, I just want to add that. But um, thank you for reminding me about you know tell the AI ask me questions and me input what I what I have about my script. So um, anyway, that that's just it. So great, thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah. Let's um, open the floor to other questions on applications or uses of AI, techniques for your premise, brainstorming, and world building. I see a question that's tagged me in the chat. In that world, I think he's talking about the wing world. Would it be cannibalism if one eats chicken wings? Uh, let's ask GPT. <laughs> Would it be an ethical problem in this world if a person ate chicken wings? Or is that considered strange? 
I would think not much weirder than us eating the fact that chickens have thighs and we eat thighs. You know what I mean? Like, we have thighs and chicken. we also eat chicken thighs. You know what I mean? All right. In a world where everyone's born with wings resembling those of birds, the concept of consuming chicken wing wings could indeed be seen as an ethically complex, even unusual question. It gives you kind of some considerations here. Although, I think if you... <clears throat> the fact that you sort of frame that question as if it should be a problem, kind of... Like, GPT will take a lot of cues from you. And GPT especially has this feeling that it, it's sort of yes and improving with you to some extent. So if you say, like, would it be a problem if this happened? Then it will be like, oh, here are some ways that it could be a problem if this happened. But then if you sort of made it come up with a bunch of... Like, if you... It, it, the thing is, it just doesn't really have opinions of its own. All it can do is give you sort of possibilities that might exist within that fictional story. So there's the answer to that. <clears throat> uh, okay, here's a question. I'm having trouble narrowing down what to ask. Um, well, uh, e if you aren't sure what to ask, I guess feel free to let me know what aspect of writing you're trying to improve at, whether it's premise, world building, grammar and proofreading, editing, revising, and would be, get, be able to give you some suggestions there. Can it give you a character sketch? I think by that you mean like just a few sentences describing the basics of who a character is. Yes, definitely. Let's do it. Suggest a protagonist for the uh, heist storyline. This is a hero with a unique set of wings. All right, Soren Stormrider tells us some details, background, motivation, skills and abilities that this character could have, personality, character arc. Yeah, there is a very, very quick way to just get ideas for character writing. And if you don't like any of it, you can always change it. it here it says Soren comes from a line of phoenix-winged aviators known for their daring exploits in the skies. That'd be cool if somebody was born with phoenix wings in this world. Um, they're vibrant crimson with shimmering golden feathers, possessing the rare ability to produce intense bursts of heat and light, resembling flames when he's threatened or ignored. Or threatened or angered, <laughs> not ignored. So there you go. It's like a little character sheet, almost like a role-playing game, which makes this kind of thing great for actually running role-playing games as well. Um, so yeah, there, there's an idea. And if you're using um, Bing, you can even say, give me a picture of the character. Let's do it. Let's get a picture of our Sorin Stormrider character. I'm going to switch over to the Bing edge model. I'm going to tell you about a character from my novel. So we'll start by giving it the info. And it's like, wow, that sounds interesting. Nice job. And then we'll say, generate me a picture of this character doing something amazing. And let's see what Dolly comes up with. Might just take a second. Usually not that long, though. Let me stop responding and regenerate the response. All right. Give it your best try. Oh, wait. Oops. So this means it's loading. Let's see what... Stormrider looks like. Here we go. Pretty cool. Of course, the hands are a little messed up. The hands are a big sticking point for this. Uh, they usually end up with too many or not enough fingers. The eyes are a little wonky too, but the in general, this is pretty good. Face is kind of goofy there. That's a pretty good one. That could almost be the cover of a book. Cool, right? So yeah, that's just like, uh, if you're just looking for ideas for characters or maybe, and remember that like, we can't exactly copyright these things. So you can't just use that artwork for whatever you want. But I find it's useful for if you're gonna do like a table reading or something like that, you want a little poster for your movie, you can just use the AI to make one, modify it with Photoshop, and otherwise just use it for stuff like, you know, non-profit type purposes, things that you aren't trying to profit from. Um, really powerful tool um, and a lot of fun. 
Here's a question from Cinnamon. If you input the first half of a long script, would AI be any good at finishing it? Not really. Um, a script is such a long document, and there's so many choices that need to be made on every level. In every scene, there are choices that need to be made. In every act, there's choices that need to be made. You know, there's all these decisions that really are kind of contingent on someone's human experience. And the most, most vitally, I would say, it's your ability as a person to assess what's important. And because AI just cannot tell what's important, uh, it doesn't know what to focus on unless you tell it, having it come up with long stories, they're going to fall apart pretty quickly. You can give it the outline, then ask, what do you think sh would happen next? Or you can say something like, how can I raise the stakes? Or something like that. But it can't really, I wouldn't say it could actually write the second half of a script for you, no. Uh, we have a comment. These images might suggest details I would use and help me delve into the character and why they would or not do would do or not do certain things. Yeah, exactly. So you can use that image to get more inspiration, maybe modify it and come back after you've changed it more. Michelle, go ahead. Your mic is muted, just if you hadn't noticed. Oh, thank you. Um so I tried using it for my novel. I mean, I realize we're talking about scripts, but um, but just I just wanted to give some experience that I tried to, you know, use it with my novel to just see if it could write a single chapter, and I thought that I did well by giving it my premise, telling the the basic characters, you know, giving that that limit of the world building. It didn't write anything that I needed. It changed the characters completely. I had to tell. I had to then further explain the characters. I wanted them to not change what it what they look like. And then I had to give them their you know their background, um, their culture, that le that level of world building. And even then, you know, it got got kind of close, but not enough. So I just wanted to you know, say that, you know, from my experience, you know, giving it the, the log line for a, for a novel and the characters and their basic backgrounds, it, I found it just didn't work, you know, so I'm seeing what it's really good at, like world building and like you ask, um, ask it to ask you a question. Is that it? Tell it to ask you a question, right. you know, and, um, it's good with that, you know, but, yeah, there are limitations. Yes, there are hallucinations. I don't 100% understand how those happen, but, you know, um, so, yeah, there are still limits to it because it's a fairly young technology. It's now just kind of, like, entering its, maybe it's teen years, you know, maybe. Um, so, um, anyway, I just I just wanted to say that and how it, how I found the limitations. Right. Yep. Yeah, and and the only way to really kind of find those is just by trying stuff. So you got to just try stuff out. Just see what it comes up with. See how good it is at certain things. And it, it's fun to just play around. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, okay. So I think if we have um, uh, no more, let me just scroll up and check for last questions. Then we'll move to uh, uh, outlining. Um, so let me just look in the chat real quick. I think that's the last one for now. Feel free to tag me if you have a question. Oh, here's a question. I may not even know the answer to this. Jeff asked, is there applications that improve upon these models specifically for writers? For instance, JetGPT4 has an API interface that outside vendors can use as part of their software and use prompts that improve the performance specific to writing or other fields. So to improve on this specifically for writers, yeah, my suggestion for that is going to be to use the custom instructions on GPT, which is actually a pretty new feature, but let me show you how it works. So go down here to the bottom left and click on custom instructions. And this way you can actually tell it, there's a field here, what would you like ChatGPT to know about you to provide better responses? So let's start with, I'm a novelist writing a fantasy novel. And now you can say, how would you like G GPT to respond? And we can, so something I've used this for in the past was this. I, oh, let me give you this uh, clear close up example. If I paste in a block of text from my novel without context, then I want you to um, 
to rewrite it from the, you know, s strengthening the POV of my main character. She is a gardener, herbalist, and survivalist, and thus is always noticing specific plants, remarking on their use, and otherwise expressing her expertise in the wild. So if you do that, then you can pay any te text that, so that only takes effect once you start a new chat, by the way. But once you have that in, you can just paste in any block of text and it will rewrite it with those considerations in mind. So it's really good for things like character voice. If you go along that route, you can tell it, I'm this type of writer trying to do this type of writing. And every time I give you text, I want you to respond in this way using the custom instructions. I don't know if other LLMs have as much of that, but it's useful. You want to see an example? Uh, let's take um, Tale of Two Cities. Let's use the, where's the full text? Okay. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, etc. Let's take this opening and let's have it rewrite it as if my main character is the lead in this book. And it's writing in first person now for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why. In the midst of these contrasting times, my senses sharpened like the finely honed blade of a dagger attuned to the secrets hidden within the natural world. It was the best of times for my vigilant eye in the age of wisdom. I, a humble gardener, herbalist and survivalist, thrived amidst the chaos. This is pretty silly. Amidst the foolishness, I, the whisperer of herbs and the keeper of life's remedies, stood as a beacon of wisdom. So if you don't like how it's in first person, we can, for instance, say, write this in third person. <laughs> okay, the senses of the main character sharpened like the finely honed blade of a dagger. A little strange. So you can tell, uh, you, sometimes you have to try different prompts in order to get it just right. But I hope you get the idea that using those custom instructions, you can tell it a rule to apply to all future text that you put into it, and thereby kind of amplify character voice in a really effective way. Write this as Hulk Hogan. In the midst of these here contrasting times, brother, the senses of the main character sharpened. <laughs> okay, this is dumb. It's almost the equivalent of uh, when you play a game for a long time and then you start adding a bunch of mods to it. So you're playing Left 4 Dead 2, except you swap out the zombies and now they're all Crash Bandicoot. And then you swap out the survivors and now one of them is Sonic the Hedgehog, one of them is Tails, one of them is Dr. Jane Goodall, and one of them is Frankenstein. And you can kind of do that with text and it's kind of funny to just to modify and modify more and more until it's unrecognizable. But you can also use it to m more sharply refine and hone that character voice in your prose writing. Here's a question. How do you do this for screenwriting? If I paste in a scene, will it work too? Yeah, it typically can handle pretty well up to like a page and a half or two pages of text at once. Um, and it can write in screenplay format or play format or audio format, and it can write in any format that you need it to. It can even export things as code. Uh, and um, it is able to, yeah, it's, it's, you're, full, you're fully able to work in scenes rather than working in prose as well. It's not always going to make the best choices. The dialogue is going to be a little unnatural and stuff like that. But you can work with any format. Yes. OK, so um, that is going to maybe wrap up where we are in premise and world building. Let's move into outlining. And this is, again, one of the strongest, best uses of this technology so far. All right, so maybe you can start with something like this. Let's, fr let's so you give it all your world building details. You give it a bunch of info. And then you can say something like, let's frame this idea in save the cat structure, assuming my script would be 90 pages long. Or if you don't want to use save the cat, you can use whatever structure you want. You can use hero's journey. You can use that weird eight point sequence thing that a lot of people like. You can frame it in Kisho Tenketsu if you really please, but I'm just going to use save the cat as an example here. So you start with that. And then you, so let's actually go back to the wing worlds. Um, Okay, stop talking as Hulk Hogan. Um, so let's say, suggest me, or give me a save the cat structure for the heist 
movie about the Phoenix guy. And uh, allocate 90 pages for the whole runtime. Or I guess let's just say the script should be 90 pages long. OK, so here's some suggestions for us. Nicely formatted with page benchmarks and everything. Oh, is it going to split Act 2A and 2B? Doesn't always do that. That's not in straight textbook Save the Cat. All right, so here's a bunch of ideas for the different scenes and what is going to be happening in these different structural beats. Opening image, introduce the Phoenix guy, a mysterious and skilled thief with the ability to rise from his own ashes. Wait, does it remember, or did I start a new? Oh, I think I started a new chat. Let me put this back in the last one. Soren Storm Rider. That's the most Warcraft name I've ever heard. Okay, so we see the awe-inspiring world of Aviara from the sky, introducing the audience to this unique wing in society. We learn about the discrimination against the vultures and the mystery of these phoenix wings. The catalyst, Soren, is falsely accused of a crime and needs to clear his name. Uh, oh, we're really short on debate here, otherwise known as trying the locks. Soren considers the options, but ultimately decides to steal evidence from the Winged Council's headquarters to prove his innocence. So it's going to give you some suggestions for what could happen in this world. You don't have to use any of this. You can modify or change them however you want. Maybe you can say something like, try a different catalyst. Make it more visceral. What is it going to give us now? Soren witnesses a brutal attack on a vulture friend by a group of winged council enforcers. The friend is left badly injured, and the incident shatters Soren's sense of safety and compels him to act. That's pretty good. So you can basically start with this and then start changing it one piece at a time until you are happy with it. And the nice thing is if you change earlier elements, the generative AI is able to extrapolate how that would modify the rest of the story. So by changing the catalyst, obviously, there's going to be a different story that is to follow. You can also try things like, what's a potential dramatic argument for this story? Identity versus prejudice. Soren's journey is one of self-discovery and understanding the significance of his unique phoenix wings. Okay, so it's gonna give us some ideas for what the kind of main theme or thematic conflict of this story could be, how to use that as a driving force behind everything that's going on. It's about a fight against discrimination, according to GPT here. And GPT is usually very kind of focused on things like mutual understanding and respect, so often its themes will be similar to this. It won't really pick incredibly dark themes for the most part. We have a question in chat. Is this recorded so we can refer to it later? Yes, this is all on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, and Discord. Uh, what else? So let's go into more outlining stuff. So you can try things like, what is the dramatic argument here? How can I sharpen that or clarify the theme? You can also focus on specific sections if you're having trouble with any part of your structure. Maybe just let's focus on premise scenes. Give me five suggestions for premise scenes that would take full advantage of that movie's premise. I kind of like that one. Let's give that a try. Give me five suggestions for they're going to call them, uh, what are they called? Uh, fun and games. Which should take full advantage of the premise and use it to its potential. So ideally, these are going to be related to that central idea of guy with phoenix wings doing a heist. The high stakes aerial chase. There we go. Winged infiltration training. The Winged Acrobatic Heist, The Hidden Winged Passage, Winged Rooftop Escape. Okay, it's giving us page numbers with these two, and I was kind of hoping just for a bunch of scattered ideas, but that's okay. These are just ideas for action scenes that could only take place in this world with the setup that we have given it. And I find that is usually what makes really strong premise scenes, is that these are ideas that, or these are scenes that take the kind of basic A plus B of your world, if it's this meets that. Here we have a heist movie set in a world where people have wings then your premise scenes are going to be scenes where your main character's heist is amplified or complicated by his wings, and the fact that he has wings or is a bird person in whatever way is going to be amplified or complicated by the heist. So if you say the movie's about something, then the second act premise scenes are where that needs to fully engage or click into place. 
or that's where you say the movie's about blank and then that is where you actually deliver on that promise All right, so that's some nice uses for this in outlining, how to come up with not only the structure of the whole thing, but also those individual sequences that you might need inspiration or ideas for. You can just tell it, give me a list of ideas for scenes that could happen in the movie. Then, of course, it's going to be your job as the actual writer. It's not a writer. It's your helper. It's your assistant. It's like your little goblin that sits on your shoulder and can yell stuff, but you will have to work those into the story on your own and find ways for those to make sense and then once you have found ways for those to make sense it makes a great tool for organizing your outline you can also just say for instance like you give it a bunch of world building details in no kind of or, or you can give it a bunch of um, plot elements in no real order and then you can ask it to turn that into an outline so it can be very scattered you can just have kind of fragments of notes and then it's very good at connecting the dots between those things and then coming up with a working outline from there. All right, writing pages. So a couple of things you can do. Obviously, our main sort of principle, if you've been in my other classes, is going to be this idea of clarity first, brevity second, voice third. Clarity, brevity, voice. So in service of that, we can start with just pasting a line and say, make this clearer. It's not always going to know, like, you're, you're going to have not amazing results from that for the most part, unless the sentence is a total mess. If it's a total mess, it will re rewrite a more readable version of it, for sure. But if you say something like, make this just clearer, or if you just say something like, make this line better, it doesn't necessarily know what you mean. It doesn't have opinions, remember? So how can it know what you would think would be better? Or And if, if you tell it to sharpen the point, and if it doesn't assess accurately what the point is, then it's going to misplace its focus in the wrong areas. So you can start by something like brevity is like a much easier way of using this. So paste in a line, say, reduce this to 100 words or less, or 100 letters or less, or whatever you want. You can tell it to do something like use stronger verbs and more specific nouns. You can say, analyze the sentence or the page for clarity. Sum having it summarize back to you what happened in the scene is actually a good way of determining if it's clear enough what is happening in your scene, because the AI is very good at telling what's going on and parroting it back to you. It's not the best at coming up with brand new original stuff, but it is quite good at assessing what you have given it. What else? We can tell it to, or we can ask it, what do you assume is going to happen next? And in that way, it's just going to use its kind of basic logic to add up the building blocks that you've given it and kind of come up with a, like, what is the most logical thing that would probably happen next? That's not always going to be incredibly valuable to you, but it might just give you an idea of what is the most logic, like what is the thing the audience would sort of expect to happen next? And that actually gives you a good thing to work from because if you know what the audience expects to happen next, then you know how to sort of subvert it because if in your stories everything is happening exactly as the audience thinks it will, then you're losing that really critical element of surprise and fun moving forward. Last week, can ask things like, how can I escalate the situation? How can I raise the stakes for my protagonist? What's an element I could introduce to make the scene scarier, funnier, etc.? Limited use of that one because, it, again, it doesn't know what's funny. If you ask it something like, you know, a character throws open their closet and something's really funny inside, it'll be like, uh, I don't know, a rubber chicken. That's funny, right? It's not always great at humor just because humor is so reliant on the human experience. And, for instance, like something that just would be so dumb that makes us laugh is something that only a person can really come up with. Like, if an, an, if an AI makes you laugh, it's usually by accident. Um, what else? So let's go into revising. So if you start with something like, oops, here's my outline. It has X problems. How could I start revising to address those specific problems? Give me a step-by-step -step guide. It'll give you, a, it'll lay out a little process for you. It'll say something like, you know, start with this character. Then you need to modify their trajectory or their arc or figure out what is motivating them and sharpen and clarify that in the early act of the story so we are able to better invest in their journey. Stuff like that. It's pretty good if you tell it what the problems are and don't rely on it to accurately assess what the problems are. So, like, you should get notes before you approach this. Then it can be a really effective revision tool if you use that as a starting point again as a starting point not as the final result but you say how can i begin to address the problems in the script it might give you some good ideas to work from you can ask questions like how can i deepen the stakes suggest some alternate climaxes is this a potentially commercial or producible idea and if not how could i make it more so this is obviously for you tv and screenwriters out there novelists do not have to worry about producibility of their work 
let's go into the winged heist world story and let's say if this was a movie what would the budget be okay it's taking into account the visual effects creating and animating wings for every character would be complicated and time consuming stunts and action sequences production design costumes makeup it's estimating it would take 50 to 150 million dollars or more how could i reduce the budget cost of this movie and make it more producible script optimization so that's kind of just taking pages out as what i'm guessing and so just taking out sequences that don't significantly contribute to the plot location selection so we're choosing locations that are more budget friendly so unfortunately this is why you saw so much kind of uh i guess you would say most the most kind way of putting this is uh high fantasy shows in the 80s and 90s that were filmed mostly in the woods um because this is just a way of limiting the scope of having to you know having to build huge cities or having to stretch the limited special effects that they had access to so you saw a lot of just people walking around in the woods and mountains in fantasy back in the 80s and 90s up until lord of the rings kind of blew the whole thing out of the water and now people were not really satisfied by low budget fantasy anymore completely killed the market for stuff like xena unfortunately practical effects so whenever possible opt for practical over cgi use creative angles lighting and props to enhance the visual impact so this is just like production suggestions more than anything else scale down action sequences that's something that we could actually tackle so while maintaining excitement reduce the complexity and scale of the action scenes and use stunts and choreography then rather than too much reliance on visual effects casting so it's suggesting casting less big names sure costume and makeup we could simplify the winged characters designs and just cut back on big sets cgi compact crew all these things i'm going to say what about just things i could do as the writer not production considerations there we go okay so this is going to focus more on stuff that we have control over minimizing crowd scenes that's almost always going to be a big one resourceful storytelling efficient descriptions limit elaborate props and really just reducing as much as possible that's always going to be your number one thing to make a story more producible is just have less of it because the more you know every minute the camera's running is going to cost you a significant amount so that's just a handy tool in revising if you're trying to write something that is able to be made or sold it's more likely if that actually feels feasible within the budget scope that your project would require We have a question in the chat cgi saves money in several instances doesn't it yeah it definitely can um it really depends on how it's being used uh obviously the ai can only give so much nuance in its answers so um let's maybe move to questions and then we'll go into a game i call comp smash which should be fun we're gonna go with a bunch of titles or movie or movies and shows that you guys are fans of and we're going to combine them together using the ai to make new stories or at least you know the several sentence description of what the story could potentially be obviously i'm not going to write these things all the way through here's a question um have you tried to upload your entire script to gpt and ask these questions and ask for specific pages for gpt comments i think that would be too much text i think there is a limit on how much you can give it at one time and the fact would be that you would have to give it just like two like one to two pages at once and then by the end of that it's not fantastic at assembling that in its mind as like a whole story on a page by page basis it would be very good at giving you that analysis or if you gave it an outline for the whole thing it would be better at doing that but it's not really at this point capable of just accepting a huge text input for a long story and then being able to analyze or make perfect sense of that um so i would look at it more as like a maybe a chapter at most at a time Ooh, i hear a helicopter um all right so where are we uh let's take questions and then we'll go to we'll play some comp smash jeff asked if i can demonstrate it writing in screenplay format sure um i just want to go back to the clarity brevity and voice 
I understand um, clarity and brevity, but how do I find my voice, or is that not what you're talking about when you say voice? So, voice refers to um, the way that you are writing. So, the words that you choose, mm -hmm. the specific way that you choose to write something. Um, so, uh, in this case, or I guess what we're mostly talking about right now is um, using AI. So, AI is very good at voice, for instance. You could tell it, mm -hmm. rewrite this passage as if the narrator is a uh, talking dog, right? And then it would sort of be able to make choices that it thinks that a talking dog would use or pick words that it thinks only a dog would know, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and in that way, it's quite good at uh, modifying text that you've given it and sort of reinterpreting it in a voice. I would say in okay. terms of finding your own, um, it's a little bit out of the scope of the AI discussion, but I think just to give a quick answer okay. to that question, don't worry too much about like consciously changing, modifying, or strengthening your voice, it is something that will be strengthened the more that you write. And it's more a matter of kind of writing a lot and then determining what your voice is. So you sort of look mm -hmm. at your body of work and then say, what is it that my voice comes out as naturally? And then emphasizing that as much as you can and trying to bring that out of your own writing rather than trying to adopt a specific style. Okay, so like, I'm just gonna just give you a, give a for instance, so like I'm writing a horror script. So if I went to chat GGB, for example, and said, hey, um, I want to begin writing my horror script in the voice of, or similar to Stephen King. It could do something like that, right? Sure, sure. Okay. Of course, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I would be sued for, you know, by, by, by him for, you know, for trying to imitate him and you know not give him credit essentially i don't i don't know if that would if i could be sued over that but let's no you'd be fine oh okay so i so let's just because i i do love stephen king so let's so it could help me with you know with writing in that style right sure yeah i would um i think that's a good exercise for sure i wouldn't probably just put your whole script into it and just tell it to do that for the whole thing but i would maybe use that on like a page by page basis and sort of assess, oh, wh when I ask it to do that, what is it changing or what is it modifying or what is it trying yeah. to bring, bring out of my text? So that way you can sort of train yourself to write in that voice from then on. Yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. And um, for my novel, if I say, I want to change how I write my novel to be kind of like, a, I don't know if you know who Daniel Steele is. She was really popular for a while and um, I think she's retired, but change it how to write like her or or emily dickinson it, it could it could teach me that right definitely i think that's a, one of the better uses of it is sort of okay. re reinterpreting things in specific voices and then you can use that to learn from and to learn how to do that on your own okay well okay thanks for answering my questions sure thanks for asking Uh, here's a question from chat. Could we write a screenplay and ask G chat GPT to create the novel? Well, you're going to run into some of the same problems that you would run into from just asking it to write something from scratch in that I don't, I guess I haven't really tried give, having it, ha, ha, I haven't gone much down that path yet. So you're welcome to give it a shot. Um, I think that in its current state, what you get wouldn't be great. I mean, it would be an adaptation, but it would lose a lot of the voice and nuance from what you originally gave it. So that would maybe be an okay starting point, and then you'd have to modify a lot from there. But it would give you something to begin with, definitely. Try sticking, if you do that in the outlining phase, you're probably gonna be getting better results. So help me re-outline this as a novel would probably be better than can you write this as a novel. All right, other questions? Here's a question from Cinnamon. I've been saying AI is great at ideas and outlining, but not good at actually writing. Do you think it will ever get great at writing as it develops, maybe in 10 years or something? Yeah, it will get a lot better at writing in 10 years. Um, will it get to the point where it can write something that is better than what a person can come up with? I, a year ago, I would not have said yes. Now, I think eventually it will be able to come up with something that is almost as good as what a person could do. I don't think it will surpass that in our lifetimes, but then again, I've been surprised so much by how much it's changed recently that I think we almost have to throw all ideas of predicting where it will go out the window. 
Um, I think it will get very close, but there will always be something just in the innate human experience that allows us to determine what is important and what matters to us and things like that. And AI will never be able to get there without a human telling it what matters. So I think just that key thing, like AI having no opinions is kind of a big impediment in it, uh, or having no emotions and having no opinions are a big impediment in it ever reaching something that is better than what a person could do. Um, but it will get up there and it will be start, it will start getting very complicated and tricky in 10 to 20 years, definitely. Here's a question. Have I tried storyboarding? Maybe outside the scope of the discussion. Storyboarding meaning um, like visual using images. Uh, you probably would not have a lot of luck doing that just because in, it, it doesn't, I don't think it would be able to maintain continuity between the different images necessarily. I think if you were, for instance, to trying to come up with an, a concept, it would, it would, okay, here's my answer. It's probably better for concept art than it is for storyboarding, just because storyboarding is inherently sequential and relies on the thing that happened before and like the character should look the same in every picture and stuff like that, or at least, you know, the very basics of it. But I, I would give it a try, see, see what you come up with. But for the most part, it's gonna be better with concept art, which doesn't require the context of things that came before and things that will be coming after it. Um, it won't really, it doesn't really have the ability to remember a story and then probably, and at least I don't think, and then give you like a series of images that would illustrate that story in perfect clarity right now at least, maybe in a couple years it'll be better at that. But for now, concept art is probably the best application. Any other questions before we move ahead to our game? Uh, Michelle. Well, I'm the only one who's asking questions. I just want to say that if you if you want some idea of where AI will is is going for the next few years, I say like maybe three to five, just look at the largest companies who are who are producing AI and um, go, you know look at some of their goals on on their websites and also go to the um, oh god I used to I used to use this all the time. It's a government website that basically um, where companies go to get um, loans and grants um, for um, for producing um, future technologies. I forget what it's called, but I and I used to go that go to this place all the time when I had my company. But if you look at those two things, you can get some idea of of where it's going. Like when I had my nanotechnology company, I um I um. I, I found out about how about basically when um, um, 3D printing would come onto the market, and you know when to invest because I was um, oh kind of almost have that I almost have that government site. Um, it's all good. Uh, if you if you remember it, feel free to link it in the chat. Yeah, later. yeah. Anyway, the point of this is that you know if you if you know how to utilize those two tools, um, then you might be able to figure out okay here's where it might be within the next three to five years um it's just you just the, the tools aren't linked ex, um, themselves but if you just know how to use those tools then you can get some idea of okay here's what here's what companies are planning to develop uh, i know ibm was really good at you could just look at you know okay here's what ibm has developed and here's where um, you know what what the grants they were being given from the government um, to develop these things and you know all that stuff was open resource so I just wanted to add that that you know it, it used to be that you could use that and you probably could use that now cool yeah let us know if you um, have any links to share yeah <laughs> okay thanks a lot uh, Jeff coming up hello Your mic is muted, just if you didn't notice. Uh, so Jeff, you'll have to un um, click the small gray microphone icon in the bottom left corner of the Discord window to unmute yourself.
or maybe you could try joining on a different uh, device if the mic that you're using is not currently working. Thank you, Nacho. He's just linked a picture in the chat that shows where it is. You're also free to leave your... Oh, there it is. Can you talk now? Yeah. Can you hear me? There we go. I hear you. Go ahead. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, there's like this Discord is very complicated. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, okay. So the um, concern that I have, and Nacho can, you know, made a little bit of reply in the side comments, but uh, the AI, I mean, the uh, actor in the writer strike is uh, targeting the AI use. Mm -hmm. And my concern is that AI tools could violate whatever turns out to be. I'm, so, I'm sorry to pause you. Sorry, if I can pause you one second. My headphones just turned off, so I actually am not hearing. But I, I want to hear the rest of this question. Just give, give, give me one moment. <laughs> To switch to speakers. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, can you hear me? I hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, um, so the writer and actor strike is uh, has AI concerns, and and the the issue hasn't really been resolved yet. So there will be a forthcoming settlement. Um, my concern is that AI tools. Um, probably will have some uh, restrictions as far as on what will be finally allowed and not allowed. You know, we don't know what that is yet. Um, we do know that um, just this last week, the, the appeals court knocked down uh, the use of AI as far as generating a picture, you know, that was trying to be copyrighted. But we don't know to what degree we'll be able to use AI tools. I imagine everything you've shown here will definitely be allowed because it is just a tool. It's not, it's like using the word, you know, using spell check. You know, we have a lot of experience where, you know, that's fine. Um, but do you have any sense of, or maybe you've talked to people, do you have any sense as to where, um, what will be allowed and not allowed in terms of AI tools? It's a good question. Um, I don't have the full answer to this just because it's so early and we're still waiting for a lot of legislation and a lot of rules to be put in place. Um, and we kind of have to just wait a couple years as the law catches up with this brand new thing because it takes so long for the gears to turn and for people to realize, oh, wh where do we draw the new lines? But it has recently kind of started to tilt towards this idea that... Um, AI generated content cannot be copyrighted in the traditional sense. There may be some kind of new copyright designation that is created for AI content and that we have like accredited prompter for that AI, but then and and and, and there might even be a certain art to or there there is a, a certain art and maybe even at some point a certain job called AI artist or AI prompt prompt creator or something like that. Prompt engineer. I think I've seen that. Prompt engineer. Yeah. So, um, I think that uh, in terms of the output, the art itself, like images especially, are going to be a problem. Within a couple years, I think more rules will be in place that you won't be able to, for instance, profit off of or publish a book that uses AI illustrations. I think we've already seen people trying to do this with mostly kids' books, and there have been published kids' books that use all AI-generated art. That is going to be squashed, is my guess. As for text, that's a completely different and much more complicated area because even the software that is used currently to detect what was generated with an AI text generator and what wasn't is not very accurate. Um, and that will take a couple years of refinement to get better at. Like there are certain patterns we can notice in the text and certain turns of phrase that the AI likes to use and things like that. But as for the text itself, um, I think that people will be able to get away with a lot more and it will be a lot longer before that gets actually completely you know like ruled out or becomes a, a, a big issue i would suggest to, to avoid those problems just by not relying on what the ai gives you as the final output like we can't just use the ai and say oh it did the work for me it's done it made the art and then use that because that's going to run into those those problems of and and a lot of people are going to try that of course you're but those are going to um, a, just give you worse work for the most part, and B, I think there will eventually be ways to better detect what was written or generated with AI and what wasn't, 
So in maybe five to ten years, they're going to start squashing or you know putting the putting the caps on that a little more. But if you just if you mainly are using it to generate things like brainstorming or like world building or things that aren't the final product but help you get to the final product, that's going to be where you are better off. So I realize I don't yeah. have a great answer to that, but I will say. Well, I mean, I think I think you're saying about everything that can be said. I just wanted to get your input, but you know, like for example, like the Save the Cat, for example. Great book, phenomenal book, right? But it's a copyrighted book. Sure. And I'm just concerned that, you know, ChatGPT has gone too far. And you, I mean, I don't even want to say it because I don't want that to be blocked because obviously it's a great tool for us to use. But if I was the writer of that book and I, or the publisher, and the people are getting, you know, ChatGPT answers from that material, I would have some concerns. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, how that's all going to be dealt with. It's a good question, especially, and, and like, that's a, that is a big question right now because, for instance, like, it may not have been trained on all the Harry Potter, it may not have scanned every Harry Potter book, but the Wikipedia articles have pretty clear plot summaries of the Harry Potter books, so it knows what happens in every Harry Potter book, like, beginning to end. Um, and you could say, similar, well, something like Save the Cat to Me is... Like, in, just in terms of the structure that it knows really well, that's all publicly re freely available resources. Like, the, the structure itself, just that, like, set of story beats, have always been released as public online free things that are shared on the on the Save the Cat website and stuff like that. For the con the text content of the book itself, I'm not, I don't think it has all of that trained in its data set. But this is just a question and an ethical concern that has come up lately, which is what specifically is in the data sets that it is being trained on? Um, and I think some authors will end up having more problems. With there's, there's lawsuits about this going on right now. Um, right. About info that is in copyrighted material clearly being part of a data set when it may not have been intended to be or may not legally supposed to be. Um, so good. I will just basically say great question is the answer to this. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Sure, sure. Um, and just blanket guidance to everybody. Yeah, don't use AI generated pictures and try to sell the results of that. You'll get away with it in the short term, but in a couple years, you will feel the pain. Great questions, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Let me see. Uh, any more questions before we do our last exercise? I think not. Not just as GPT also does incorporate a lot of trademarked terms. If you were to include those in your novel manuscript or screenplay, that could be a problem. That's a good point. Cinnamon says, I'm sure there'd be a pirated version of Save the Cat publishing the whole text openly online. Would it be using that too? It's not supposed to, and I don't think so. Um, but the, uh, in the coming years, we may see more instances of stuff like that happening. And if so, it will lead to a bigger problem. Right now, I do not believe it is trained on like uh, pirated material. All right, let's go into our last activity. These are great questions and great discussion um, all throughout today. So thank you so much, guys, for being here and trying this out and, and uh, learning more about AI. Let's go play the Comp Smash game. So I want to see a bunch of titles of movies and shows um, in the chat that you are a fan of. Uh, don't You don't even have to think about it too carefully. Just tell me a bunch of stuff. I'm going to start with, let's say, Evil Dead 2. Okay, give me a bunch more. Let's just type stuff into the chat. Gladiator, thank you. And I'll show. Parasite, keep going. I want to see a bunch of these. Tangled. Hocus Pocus. I'm going to keep adding my own as well just to have you guys keep going. Let's go with uh, True Lies. Let's go with, um, how about Palm Springs? Fiddler on the Roof. Paw Patrol, Cabin in the Woods. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. Now, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to take these comps, and we're going to smash them together with AI, and we're going to see what we get. I'm going to pick a random one. How about... Oh, I got... Old Boy meets Tangled. Old Boy meets Tangled. That sounds messed up. All right, let's see what we get. So on, I'm going to use, G, I should probably use Bing for this in general, but I'm going to use GPT for it right now. So I'm going to say, <laughs> let's make a new log line for a movie. Let's make a log line for a new movie. The comps are old boy and tangled. 
um, the genre. Well, I'm just going to see what it gives me based on just that. In a world where nature's secrets hold the key to freedom, a skilled guard... Wait a minute. Oh, it's using the custom instructions I gave it. Let me just take those instructions off really quick. All right. Let's see what it gives us. Twisted Fate. A tale of ensnared desires. When a reclusive artist wakes up in a secluded tower with no memory of his past and a mane of hair that grows uncontrollably... He must unravel a dark mystery from his forgotten life, battling his inner demons and a relentless enemy. In a modern-day thriller that fuses the mind-bending twist of old boy with a tangled web of secrets entangled. <laughs> That's so silly. Um, I'm going to try a couple of these and just see which one I like and want to have it expand on. Uh, let's do Parasite and Gladiator. I like that. Let's try another. Paras oh, wait. When did Parasite come out? Does it know what Parasite is? It does, okay. In a ruthless world where power is everything, a cunning but destitute con artist infiltrates the inner circle of a corrupt emperor's court, rising to become his most trusted advisor and secret weapon. As he plots to expose the empire's darkest secrets, he must navigate a treacherous web of lies, betrayal, and deadly gladiatorial combat in a gripping tale that combines the... Po this just sounds like Gladiator. <laughs> uh, let's do one more, and then we'll see if it comes up with anything we like. Um, let's do... Evil Dead and uh, Sound of Music, sure. The Sound of Evil. In the remote haunted woods of post-World War II Austria. This sounds awesome. A spirited governess fleeing her troubled past seeks refuge at a sinister isolated estate. Ooh. As she bonds with a reclusive family under her care, they must unite their talents and courage to confront an ancient evil lurking in the woods using a macabre blend of music and chainsaw-wielding heroism and a spine-chilling mashup of Evil Dead and Sound of Music. I love this one. Okay, let's stick with this and let's modify this a little bit more. So we're going to say, uh, well, I mean, this is, this is all pretty great stuff as it is. So she bonds with a family under her care, reclusive family. They must unite their talents and courage to confront an ancient evil so in that case we uh might want to instead of um her teaching them how to sing la do re mi fa so etc maybe she's training them how to fight the monsters that live in the woods so the protagonist is brought in not as a governess but as an instructor to teach the kids to fight the monsters in the woods. So GPT is so good at context that I can just tell it that and it will modify the log. It knows I mean modify the log line with that information in mind. I don't need to tell it to modify the log line with that in mind. All right. Um, in the remote haunted woods, a fearless combat instructor seeking refuge from her own demons is rec recruited to train a recru reclusive family's children in the art of monster hunting. As she forges a bond with the youngsters, they must harness their newfound skills and courage to confront the ancient evil in the woods using the music and chainsaw heroism. Okay, that's pretty cool. Let's um, change one more element. Let's not go with post-World War II Austria. Let's set this in modern day. Big city. I don't want to see this at a rem remote state. Let's find a way to set this in a big city. Make specific choices. In the heart of modern day New York, oh, this is like Evil Dead Rise, where ancient evil lurks in the hidden corners, a battle-hardened martial artist instructor grappling with her own troubled past is recruited to train a family's gifted children in the art of hunting urban monsters. As she forms a powerful bond with the youngsters, they must harness their skills and bravery. That's pretty good. What would be some songs from this musical? Here's a couple suggestions for songs. City's Lullaby, Training Montage. Of course, you gotta have a Training Montage song. Monsters in the Shadows, Chainsaw Symphony. Ooh, well, gives us little suggestions for what would happen within the narrative of each of these songs, too. Um, let's get some lyrics for Chainsaw Symphony. In the heart of the night, where darkness does thrive, we stand in the shadows, we're ready to fight. That doesn't really rhyme. With chainsaws in hands, our spirits alive. We'll conquer the monsters. Together, we'll stride. And then we have pre-chorus, chorus, verse 2. It gives us a whole song. 
In our chainsaw symphony, heroes will be. We'll break the dark spree and set our city free. All right, well, good starting point, at least. It's pretty silly. Let's ask, what's the suggested MPAA rating for this? Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to say R, personally. Oh, it gives us PG-13. This rating is typically applied to films that contain some level of intense or violent sequences, but would not warrant an R rating. Well, it's based on Evil Dead, so I think it should be R, GPD. Nice work. <laughs> okay, we're basically at the end of our class for today. So you can check the chat and see if the, uh, you're interested in any of the upcoming boot camps. You can vote in that little poll and let us know. Um, we also have those upcoming classes that we told you about, so definitely come by. These are all free and public classes. Oops, let me move the window down. So we hope to see you guys for some of these, like, for instance, Intro to Novel Outlining, September 2nd from 12 to 2. Or maybe you could come by tomorrow for sci-fi ideas, sci-fi brainstorming from news articles and tech. I hope to see some people there. 12 to 2 on Script Camp tomorrow. And um, come by a table read for sure, Sunday 2 p.m., Tuesday 11 a.m., Saturday 2 a.m. Pacific, but that's going to be 10 a.m. London. Here's all the upcoming classes. I will open the floor just for last questions and comments until we reach 2 o'clock. Any last words, thoughts from anyone here? Go ahead, Michelle. Your mic is on mute. So, um, so the Robocalypse class is going to be the same thing as the sci-fi? Well, um, Robocalypse is the name that we gave to this weekend. This weekend we're calling Robocalypse because oh. we have two sci-fi related events on two sequential days. So that was this class okay. today, and tomorrow we have sci-fi story ideas. Okay, okay. Um, well, um, okay, so um, that, that's actually all I wanted to know was uh, it's Robocalypse Weekend. Okay, all right. Um, that's all I, all I know. It's a great class. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm definitely going to start using this to improve my outlining. Awesome. Thanks so much for asking great questions. Oh, thank you. Here's a question from Cinnamon. What's the next development you'd like to see in AI? I wonder if, if that's a question for me or just for everybody. Um, what I would love to see personally, I'll just answer that because <laughs> I'm on the stage. Um, so um, I would like to see um, the things it can do right now are pretty amazing. But what I would love is to, to, to find a way to make it have better memory within a conversation. So like, for instance, in GPT, if you tell it something early on, chances are it will forget that thing or forget the rule that you set early on. I think the custom instructions were a big help for this, and I barely even tried using those. Those just came out like a week ago, I think. So that is actually a useful way to address that problem of sort of forgetting what is the overall idea behind the conversation. So I'd like to be able to kind of tune the conversations before we even engage in them and sort of set additional context for it before we start giving it those inputs. So that would be a useful just like functionality that I would like to see and just like an improvement in it. As for what it could actually do, I'd like to see more integrated voice stuff too. So like connecting it with AI that would be able to speak out loud and maybe even create music. I wanna see music stuff, that would be neat. There's some ideas for you. Here's a question. I'd love to try the 30 day class. Are these free? And thanks so much, I will definitely watch again. Yeah, the um, intro classes are totally free. So you can come to the class on September 2nd, the class on September uh, 9th, or the class on September 30th. Those are all from the novel boot camp. Those are all week zero and week one. Week zero and one classes are all open to the public. Hope to see you there. Any other last questions in our last minutes? Looks like not, so we'll wrap up for now. Oh, here's a question. Log lines, your fave use? Are log lines my favorite use of AI? I think is what he's asking. Um, it's not wonderful at writing log lines just 
well, it's good at phrasing a very readable sentence, which is nice. So it's good for reducing log lines. As for coming up with them, not as much. My favorite use of this is in organizing outlines. So that would be, you just give it a bunch of ideas for your world or wh whatever you have for the story, and then asking it to fill in the gaps and to connect those things, because that kind of utilizes its great skill sets of an analysis, connecting ideas and like drawing con con connections between things. Um, so having it fill in the blanks of an incomplete outline is my favorite use. All right, that's our time, guys. Thank you so much for coming by. We hope to see you at any of these upcoming classes. Come by tomorrow, same time slot for sci-fi idea brainstorming based on tech headlines. It should be super fun. We have a guest who's a science teacher. It'll be a great time. We'll see you guys there. Have a great rest of your Saturday.